Okay, so get 15 grams of protein in if you're train strength training and if you're adding in a little bit of cardio at any point, um, you want to add 10 or 15 okay. grams of carbohydrate? We say about 30. 30? Yeah. All up, you're looking at maybe 150 calories total before you're doing a strength and, and cardiovascular type workout. Otherwise, it's around 100 calories from protein. Okay. Which is well, that's a lot. Yeah, that's more than 15 grams though, right? I mean, so like 20 grams ish. Yeah. Five, yeah. Five, so five. they say 90, but who does 90 calories? You're like, what's 90? <laughs> yeah. We'll just round it up. <laughs> yeah. What's the role of fat? Because, you know, fat, you know, fat coffee or bulletproof coffee kind of thing has been such a craze. Is fat uh, detrimental or is it just not helpful? And so if you're looking from a training perspective, it takes a really long time to get out of your stomach and intestines. So it doesn't really fuel you in any scope of the matter. The thing with bulletproof coffee and all of the things that they're like, here's your MCTs in your coffee, it's for satiation. It's to help with that. Okay, let's get that cognitive focus and hold that caffeine because sure. it extends the half-life of caffeine. Oh. It also clears out your blood sugar. So you feel like your focus, but really you're just on the edge of being hypoglycemic. <laughs> and so it's about the satiation and extending the half-life of the caffeine. Yeah. Cause it is satiating. It does curb your hunger. When I, again, like I said, I did a lot of fasting and I mean, I was like 24, 36, 18, 24, you know, like doing like big fasts and, or what <laughs> feels like big fast. Cause I don't like to be hungry. Um, it, I mean, coffee with a little bit of fat or like a, you know, nut butter, like a, like a cup, like a fat cup, fat bomb kind of thing. Like yep. that stuff would be like, I mean, you could survive on 200 calories a day or 300, just like, because you've kept enough fat in you to, to satiate, but that makes sense with the caffeine to it. It extends that life. Okay. Just using me as an example for the morning workout people. What about afterwards with a refeed timing? Like what kind of macros are more important after? Specific for strength training. When you are in your reproductive years, it's 30 grams of good quality protein, high leucine containing protein. When we start to hit late perimenopause and menopause, it's 40 grams because we have more anabolic resistance. So if we want to make the strength training work for us, we also had to have a higher amount of circulating amino acids post-exercise. And we see that it's a 30 to 45 minute window after strength training to really get that in for women. For men, it's a different story because you see, oh, it's not that important for the nutrient timing for men. But again, it's because the way that they come back down to baseline is different from women. They can hold off having um, food for up to two to three hours before they really take mm -hmm. a hit. But for women, it's such a short window because we come back down to baseline so quickly. And then should it be more, does the carbohydrate or fat matter with fueling after a workout? For strength training, not so much. But if we're looking at a cardiovascular standpoint, we look to get about one gram of carbohydrate with that 30 grams of protein. So one gram per kilogram. So what is that? I'm trying to convert my head from metric to imperial. So if it's one gram per kilo, so it'd be half a gram per pound of carbohydrate with your 30 grams of protein. What about muscle synthesis, is it called muscle th synthesis or protein synthesis? When you kind of have a certain amount of protein every so often in the day, there's mm -hmm. like a mechanism there. What, what, what is that? Yeah. So that's your muscle protein synthesis or your mTOR. We look at regular distribution throughout the day to keep a certain amount of amino acids circulating so that you're getting a feedback that, okay, we're going to turn it off and then we're going to turn it on. Then we're going to turn it off and then we're going to turn it on. I think this is also where that conversation of, well, you can't have more than 25 grams of protein because it's not absorbed, it comes from, which is not true. Mm. We see that there's a certain amount that will turn on the mTOR and anything above that isn't that beneficial for muscle protein synthesis. Okay. But it is beneficial for other things in the body like neurotransmitter health, gut health, where other things are using amino acids. So when we're talking about like that 30 gram hit for women, it's not that the extra five grams isn't going to be absorbed or it's going to be turned into fat. That's complete BS. We look at it as like, we need that extra leucine that's coming from those 30 grams to really tip over the amount of leucine that's in the muscle to keep that mTOR working for women. And the extra essential amino acids that 
are circulating is going to go for neurotransmitter health or some of the other aspects like within the gut or nervous system. Now for men, it's that 20 grams because that's all they need to tip over that, that mTOR. And yeah, if they're getting a little bit more, again, they have more circulating for other things. Hmm. So, and then if you do that, it's like four times a day, is that, or what is the, what is the magic formula to activate mTOR and what does mTOR do? So mTOR is, um, it is a protein that actually stimulates the satellite cell to develop. And so this is where we're talking about muscle protein synthesis. We're talking about the proteins that develop into muscle cells. Got it. So it starts in the brain and feeds forward to the muscle. And so it's a feedback mechanism. Mm -hmm. We're looking at how to keep that kind of even throughout the day. We say around 30 grams at each meal. Mm -hmm. So that's three times and then 15 grams at each snack. And then if you're training hard, then you're going to be altering a little bit because there's a certain set amount of protein that you want to get in a day. That baseline is about 1.1 grams per pound, Mm -hmm. especially as we get older. And then you can divide it up. So you might need to have a little bit more at your meal. You might look at having a little bit more, especially Mm post-exercise. So it depends on where you are and what you're doing with your training, as well as just keeping it at regular intervals throughout the day. Okay. So a little bit more with around training, maybe a little bit less otherwise. And is there a certain amount of meals in a day? Cause I feel like that's another, that's another area that's come and gone so much is like, you know, lots of little meals throughout the day to the theory of just, you know, OMAD one meal or two meals and having long, long windows of, you know, time restricted feeding. Um, what is, what is best for, I mean, if you want to cover, cover the bases, men and women, but definitely for, for women in general, like what is, what is the right amount of meals to have in a day? I don't know if it's the right amount of meals because that's kind of individual, but there's a lot of really cool, interesting research coming out about your circadian rhythm. Okay. And we know that women's rhythms are a little bit longer than men's. So mm-hmm. this is why we tend to want to go to bed earlier and get up earlier because our mm-hmm. our circadian rhythm is a little bit different than men's. So if we're looking at how cortisol peaks and drops and how our hormones pulse and drop, because it does throughout the day, we have pulses. We know that eating more up to about the one o'clock period and then starting to taper down and having a little bit more of your carbohydrate scope in the earlier part of the day and more of the protein scope towards the afternoon Hmm. is how it works with your body's rhythm. Hmm. And then when we get into people who are like, oh, I've been doing time-restricted eating and I need to do this and that, it's like, well, first let's look at that research has been done on rats, has been done on men, and has been done on obese sedentary women. But if you're really hard and fast pulled to that rule, then stop eating after dinner and then eat breakfast. So you have a 12 hour window overnight, which is really called regular eating, but then you're (laughs) also giving your body a little little break with your circadian rhythm. So the best is, uh, I I mean, that's probably the most common. I fasting just isn't my favorite and, um, uh, never has been, but I tried yeah. and, but what feels logical is somewhere around that 12 or 13 hours, whatever that circadian sort of more fasting window. Um, so is that, is that something safe that you can do all the time then? Yeah, absolutely. Because if we're looking at like the big scope for health, right. Mm-hmm. we see all these little trends where you're trying to m- micromanage your body composition, you're micromanaging how you feel, but it's not long-term like if you're looking at long term who can do time restricted or fasting for you know your 16 hour fast that kind of stuff right it's not that sustainable for life so when we pull it back down to more granular and we're looking at the way that our body responds to day and night and we see that we have this circadian rhythm that also changes across the seasons with daylight mm-hmm. we can stick to the pattern of we our body needs more fuel when we are awake to help with hormone, to help with cognition, to help with focus. So when we look at scoping that again, like I said, carbohydrate up till, you know, around the noon, one o'clock, and then a little bit more protein, not saying no protein and no carbohydrate, just the way you scope it. And then it's at nighttime, not eating like, because we've gotten out of the habit of what it means to eat and sit down and have a meal. Cause you see people eating in their car. You have people who are eating at dinner at 11 o'clock at night, like there we've lost kind of not really the the quote rules of eating, but we've become so disconnected of what it means to be nourished 
Mm -hmm. And we're just like, oh, I'm eating because I'm bored or I'm eating because I'm hungry or I'm eating because my friend's eating. Like we've become so disconnected. So if we think about it from like, okay, what does my body need? It needs energy now and I need to sleep well. So I'm not going to eat two hours before bed because I want a really good parasympathetic response while I'm sleeping. And then I'm going to wake up and body's going to need fuel. So I'm going to eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's just a general pattern that everyone I think has lost in modern day. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And it's part of it is so much mixed information. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so then if we're, if, if you're, if you're going to hold up to sort of that 12 ish hour window, which is probably the best for gut health and sleep as well, then, yeah. and if, you know, say, take for instance, me, I leave to go work out at six 30 in the morning. So I'll want to back that up from that f- sort of 15, 20 grams of protein that I have at 630 in the morning to 630 at night, right? Or does that or does that little bump in the morning not really count? Oh, it's looking at fuel for some training that you're going to be doing, right? It's not going to break into all the health benefits and parasympathetic response you have. So it's 12 hours or it's 11 hours, but you're just getting a good break between 10 and 12 hours where your body can kind of rest, digest, get into parasympathetic, do the reparation it needs that happens while you're sleeping, consolidate memories, consolidate physical activity, stress, all of those things. It's just when you're eating right before bed, then that stays in the system, right? And you can't get into the parasympathetic that you need to have optimal sleep architecture. More about sleep. It's more about the sleep and recovery and parasympathetic state that your body needs to get into so that you can actually properly um, refuel by sleeping, right? Or, you know, recover. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I understand. Let's finish off with some supplements because I feel like this is another area that gets, again, there's just so much information about it. Um, you talked about creatine. I had actually never taken creatine until about a week ago. And then I started and I had, I just like, it wasn't something that anyone ever really recommended highly. It wasn't something that, and I feel like women get afraid of it because I mean, even my first instinct, I was like, Ooh, does this is like, is that water weight? Like a little bit of like, I was like, Oh, and women get scared of that. But then it's like, no, the whole point is, is that you put lean muscle, mus- lean muscle mass on and to have more, you know, a better resting metabolic rate with the amount of lean muscle mass you have. And, you know, even if it It does do anything. It goes further than that. So Mm -hmm. creatine has now been named by the WHO as an essential nutrient for women. Stop it. Yeah. And oh my God, is- something that scares so many women is literally an essential. And from what I've heard that to get the right amount of creatine, to get the three grams or four or five or whatever it is that you take, you need like a couple pounds of animal meat. Yeah. And I'm vegetarian, so oh, I'm shit. already compromised, right? Wow. I know. So when we look at the research and Abby Smith Ryan out of UNC has done a lot of research on creatine, not only like in the sports space, but in the general health space across women's lifespan. So we see that it's essential for pregnancy as well. So women like no supplements during pregnancy, but creatine is actually super beneficial. So when we look at creatine and what it does, it supports all the fast bioenergetics in, in the body. So we're looking at gut health and we're looking at the mucosal membrane of our intestines. And for women, we degrade it a lot faster than men. So this is why we have greater incidences of GI distress We look at brain health and mood, and there've been some really cool clinical trials looking at SSRI and creatine versus just SSRI and really depressive episodes. And women who are adding creatine don't drop into the significant, really severe depressive episodes. And if they do, they come out of it really quickly because creatine is so important for brain health. And women have 70 to 80% of the stores that men have. And then by the nature of not eating as much or being more aware that of the impact of animal protein, they're not eating as much either. So they're really low in creatine. Unbelievable. So every woman should take creatine every day for ever. Yeah. Either that or eat a lot more meat. If you like this clip and you want to hear the whole episode, click at the bottom of your screen.